Hello, uh, we're here with Joshua Casey, who is running for Washington State Auditor. Uh, Joshua, would you like to go ahead with your two minute introduction? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, first off, thank you all so much for you know spending your Sunday with us and uh, with me and uh, letting me introduce myself. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Joshua Casey and I'm running for Washington State Auditor. I'm a CPA with a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. My bachelor's degree is in accounting. My master's degree is in information systems and operations management. I have over a decade of experience in accounting and auditing. Uh, most specifically, I have experience working with uh, PwC and Deloitte, which are two of the largest global uh, auditing firms in the world. Um, and PwC in particular, uh, I quickly had ascended to uh, management level. And uh, this was because of my strong technical proficiency and uh, my leadership in building a better company through the coaching of staff, uh, fostering diversity in the workplace, and creating a sense of community. Uh, in my role as uh, in management, I was responsible for global audits, uh, like, like specialized uh, global audits that were uh, for brands that you all would be very familiar with. Uh, if I were to say the names of them. But um, so I worked with them and in the management function. And uh, recently, about a year ago, I started my own practice, which is uh, called Casey Wolfer CPAs. And uh, I have been um, working in that for about a year now and it's working primarily with small businesses in the community. Um, so the reason I'm running today is because of the shortfalls of the incumbent by not having both leadership and audit expertise. Uh, specifically, whenever it came to pandemic planning, the auditor's office had an opportunity to test out uh, government preparedness. So, for example, you know, looking at uh, emergency planning a little bit more in depth and identifying seconds. potential gaps that could have happened uh, whenever, you know, at the early onset, they could have identified potential issues. Um, it said nothing was done uh, and any issues that could have been identified as part of an audit were instead being figured out in real time. Um, I guess, Thank you. Uh, yeah, and the only question is, is there, could we have done more uh, to... Thank you, your time is up. Oh, okay. Thanks. Okay, great. And we'll, we'll, we'll have more questions and give you a Yeah, chance there's a lot of jingles and stuff going on too, so I was <laughs> <laughs> adjusting to that. So. Yeah. Sorry, the jingles are the timer. Yeah, okay. gotcha. it's a little hard. Uh, let's <laughs> see here. So I'm going to move on to question number one, and that is Liz. All right. Yeah, so how we carry out the auditor's of primary responsibility of ensuring effective government operations in ways that do not undermine or limit the delivery of poor public services. Should government okay. run like a business or like a collective effort for the common? Okay, and Liz will, Liz will ask uh, question number one. Right oh, now. sorry, okay. And the responses to these are two minutes. Okay, all right. Hi, how are you doing? Hey, good. Okay, I'm gonna get my chat box open again and... And that doesn't seem to want to work right now. So um, why don't we go ahead and have somebody else ask the question. Okay, uh, I'll go ahead and ask this one. Um, it says, how will you carry out the auditor's primary responsibility of ensuring effective government operations in ways that do not undermine or limit the delivery of core public services? And should government run, be run like a business or a collective effort for the common good? Yeah, so I think that, um, the, the best way to to not undermine or uh, limit the delivery of core public services is to uh, implement modernized auditing strategies. So there's a lot of ways that we can do more to make sure that we're not impacting the business uh, business or government units uh, as much as you know as a lot of audits do. Um, that's one of the biggest complaints I always get from oddities is that they feel like there's a lot of impact to uh, from audits to what their operations are. Because they're at the end of the day, they're, what they're doing isn't responding to audits. It's more so, um, you know, whatever their day-to-day -day is. So the biggest thing you can do is, you know, from an auditing, we can modernize the audit approach. And so that typically reduces the amount of testing time that's performed um, and overall just making the auditing process a lot easier. There's a lot of new modern, modern auditing approaches which I've implemented as part of my experience with PricewaterhouseCoopers and Deloitte where we you know just streamline and make the processes more efficient and least impactful 
Um, should it, the government be run like a business or like a collective effort for the common good? I guess the answer is a combination of both. Um, business obviously is concerned with bottom line profit, uh, which is you know not something that you're doing in government. It's not a huge, you know, it's it, that's not the goal of government. So at the end of the day, we're all trying to get the common good. So, but I do think from a business perspective, we need to be efficient and that you know and we're doing the processes. So you know efficiency and um, but quality as well. And so it should be focused on the common good and the inputs in determining what is the best process is, or the best process for auditing is always gonna be, how can we impact the, you know, the most lives in the best way possible? And that's always gonna seconds. be the end result for government. Great, thank you. Um, so now I'm gonna put question two in the chat box and we're going to ask Constance. Okay. Great, thanks Joshua for being here today. Question two, if elected, what steps would you take to strengthen protections for whistleblowers? Yeah, so this is actually part of one of the tenets of my platform. Uh, so I think one of the biggest things that we're missing right now is that there is one of the metrics that's being used to, uh, to identify how good the state auditor's office is doing is they say if they resolve a whistleblower complaint within a year. Uh, what I have seen in industry is not a year, it's usually around 45 days, and that's because of the impact that it has to those who make whistleblower complaints. If you think about the process, there's a lot of people who are you know, going through this, there could be the person who's accused could be innocent, uh, the person who's accusing could feel threatened by something, uh, and so a one year metric is definitely not something that is, uh, is the best metric to use. Um, it definitely seems like it's a, it seems like something to sort of give yourself a better better metrics than than really the best uh, best practices. So um, one of the things that really builds out people's strength and uh, people's people's ability to believe in the whistleblower program is a knowing that the problem is going to get resolved quickly one way or the other. And sometimes if people feel like you know it's going to be a year long process, there's you know it's it's something that can definitely deter people from actually uh, making a whistleblower complaint. So in that regard, I think that that's the biggest thing that we can do is we can definitely decrease that uh, from, you know, from one year to 45 days. And obviously there are going to be cases where they definitely go a lot longer than 45 days. They can't, 30 seconds. But, um, you know, but there are some cases, for example, like there was one of the whistleblower cases that were on the website there. Someone had left an hour and a half early for, uh, before Thanksgiving. And that's definitely a case that probably didn't need to take several months to resolve. Um, you know, and it's definitely, you know, something that should have been resolved very quickly and definitely within a 45 day time, right, time frame. So. Great. Thank you. Uh, question number three, Katie. Great. Um, question three, what are your top priorities for this position if you win the election? Yeah, one of the, the top priorities is, I've spoken a little bit about it before, is modernizing the uh, Washington State Auditor's Office. So uh, there's a lot of approaches that are out there that are new and that, you know, I am a CPA by trade. And so I have implemented a lot of these new processes. One of the big ones out there now is robotic process automation. And long story short, it's basically comparing, it's basically taking these manual processes that auditors are doing and making them into a much more streamlined, efficient process. It's uh, it's cutting edge right now, but it's something that I would like to bring to the office. And um, second of all, I think, you know, I've talked a little bit about the whistleblower process that I would definitely want to, uh, you know, refine. Um, and third, most important, I think um, the, you know, I think just having a CPA in the office is very important um, because, you know, in, in many states, there is a CPA that is, it's actually required that they have a CPA in the office. And that's because in the private sector, to even sign an audit report, you have to be a CPA because there's a lot of requirements that go into becoming a CPA. It's, you know, you have to have a master's degree, a bachelor's degree of accounting. Uh, you also have to have experience, continuing education requirements. Um, and that's why it's required to, before you can even sign a report. In this case, the incumbent doesn't have a CPA. Uh, so it's, you know, it's surprising that the public sector is actually held to a lower standard in this case than the private sector, when more seems to be at, uh, at risk. Um, beyond that, 30 seconds. Uh, beyond that, I think, you know, there's, besides modernization, there's also the risk assessment approach. I think there's not enough flexibility currently inside of the uh, process to allow other audits. For example, when the pandemic came up, there should have been some flexibility to say, what are some of the risks that's facing government and how can we 
quickly assess Ten those seconds. and identify those and communicate them with government uh, and so that they're not learning in real time what those issues are. Great, thank you. Uh, and now question number four, uh, Jason. Uh, what do you see as a role of the state auditor in helping make government more transparent and open to the public? Yeah, I mean, as with any auditor, it's, you know, the, the biggest thing is that, you know, where you have to have independence and objectivity and the public has to believe that there is, you know, there's no conflicts of independence and objectivity whenever you have somebody. And as a CPA, it is required that I am independent and objective. And I think that that's one of the, I'm just looking over the question again, that's going to make the, you know, it makes government more transparent, open to the public. People know that, you know, I don't have connections that, you know, I don't, work in another, I wasn't a King County executive somewhere else where I've actually built processes and now I'm turning around and auditing those same processes, uh, which would obviously be an impairment of independence. Um, so I think that, you know, there's part of the transparency is, is that, and I think, you know, there's obviously, you know, always room for improvement. And I think that, you know, as part of auditor, you have to, you know, always be thinking of ways to be uh, getting better information to to the public and making sure that they're very much aware of what's going on. And, and I think also whenever you miss something big, like for example, like the pandemic, you know, doing some more assessments around pandemic assessments and, and identifying potential gaps as, you know, there's a looming pandemic on the horizon. I think that, you know, you have to acknowledge that, you know, you, you missed something and that was because of your expertise. And I think, you know, I think the biggest thing is that we have to be, uh, you know, any auditor has to be uh, really seconds. completely, you know, independent. And, uh, and I think, you know, better reports, I think giving recommendations as well, those need to be public. In a lot of cases, I, the reports that I've seen, those uh, recommendations, especially on the financial audits or even on the peer review that the Washington State Auditor's Office received, uh, those recommendations, Ten they're seconds. typically provided along with a report when not provided. Um, and I think that they should be provided as well, uh, just to provide more transparency. Great, thank you. Um, so now we are going to move into our uh, follow-up questions and the responses to these are one minute apiece. Okay. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and open that up to the board right now. Um, does anybody have a follow-up question? Please raise your hand or uh, post it into the chat box. Jason. Uh, hi. Uh since uh, a lot of uh, businesses and organizations have to go through these audits and a lot of times in their business strategy and processes, they don't um, necessarily have a good strategy or process when the state comes in and audit them. Um, what kind of su suggestions um, that the state can offer uh, businesses to to have this strategy uh, uh, in their business plan? I think it really comes down to, you know, anytime I've ever audited somebody, the process ownership of kicking off the audit and the communication all comes to the, to the Washington State Auditor's Office. So, you know, at the end of the day, or any auditor, so, I mean, at Deloitte PwC, it's always, I'm the one setting the pace for, for what's going to be discussed, what the timeline looks like. And I think there just has to be clear dialogue between the auditee and the auditor. Uh, it's, it's, it's honestly without any sort of, you know, clear communication, it creates a lot of frustration. And in my earlier career, you know, I certainly have experienced that, you know, later uh, in my career, you know, I'm seconds. much better at, at uh, achieving, you know, much uh, clearer communication. But at the end of the day, it's up to the auditor's office to make sure that there's clear communication between uh, between what the expectations are and how the goals are going to be achieved. And I think whenever there's issues that are identified, there has to be dialogue. Um, a lot of times there's no dialogue and people are just uh, auditors assign issues. And uh, from there, they don't, um, they don't have much dialogue with the actual business. So, all right. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jeff. Uh, yeah, thanks for being here. So you mentioned how long it yeah. takes the current auditor's office to you know, process a lot of audits. Um, and, and I think, you know, one, factor that goes into that is the underfunding of the auditor's office, um, like a lot of government. Um, so I'm wondering, um, how do you see yourself advocating for your office for greater funding in order to speed up auditing times? And what experience have you had um, lobbying a legislative body or other government um, budget setting body 
uh, to increase funding. For yeah, I mean, you know, auditors, uh, all of the auditors that I've ever worked with, you know, chief audit executives at Fortune 500 companies, they always want a bigger budget. It's always something that they want. There's no, there's definitely not a, you know, that there's not, I've never met one of them who's not couldn't use, you know, some more additional funding. The reality is, is that, you know, there's not that much funding, uh, especially whenever people consider it more of a compliance type uh, function rather than sort of a value add function, especially in business. Um, so, but the, the big seconds. thing is, is to convince everybody and make them see the value of audit. And uh, so I think the, the biggest thing is, is that you have to be more efficient with what you can do. And you can actually, there are so many different methods to be more efficient with the same budget. There's no reason that there should be a 20% increase in budget for the last two years, like the current auditor has done. Um, I think seconds. that she could have used the budget that she currently had with and achieved sufficient results with more efficiencies. Great, thank you. Uh, any other further questions? Jason. Um, it seems like to me if uh, a company has been audited, um, it increases uh, not only uh, shareholder value, but uh, public trust, uh, and maybe uh, corporations and, and, uh, and businesses should uh, help pay for some of those audits. What are your thoughts on that? I think it depends on what it's for. I mean, in the, in the public, in the private sector, you know, if you're auditing, you know, a, a Fortune 500 company, for them to even sell stocks, they have to, you know, they have to have an, uh, an audit's opinion that their books are stated financially, that everything's, everything that they're representing in their financial statements is correct and accurate. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's pretty common for, the, for them to fund their own uh, audits. And uh, as long as they have an independent and objective audit, I mean, it's, it's pretty commonplace. And absolutely, I think that they should pay for it. That's, that's actually seconds. the standard. Um, so I would argue that they, they can certainly cover some of those costs. All of them probably and should. Great, thank you. Um, further questions? I have one if other folks don't, all right? So we all know that like auditors are the watchdogs of state agencies and you know, they perform the government uh, audits and fraud allegations. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about like your comfort and experience with, uh, with forensic accounting. Yeah, so I mean, a lot of the work I've done, so it's not just necessarily financial statement audits, uh, which I have done compliance audits, but yeah, there have definitely been some investigative audits that we've performed where we've been at trying to identify uh, potential issues. So one of the big things that we look at from a, even from a financial statement audit is we take into consideration what the you know, what potential fraud could exist. Uh, it's required for every financial statement audit. We have to do that as, for, as part of being a CPA. Um, so that is definitely one of the um, the tenets of what we do, and fraud is uh, something that we actually have to have a brainstorming session on. So it's, it's an ongoing process, and and so I've looked into whistleblower complaints and identified done deep down audits. So identify if there's any potential risk to financial statements, um, but even broader, just identifying you know where issues exist and uh, narrowing seconds. down uh, sort of who's responsible for what uh, and doing digging down into that. So I. Great, thank you. Uh, Jason. Uh, yes, uh, within, I, I guess, uh, last month, Mississippi have found that they've misappropriated about $90 million, uh, including uh, a football player um, getting paid for a speech that he didn't give. And um, have you heard about uh, that? scandal or, or misappropriation of funds in Mississippi and w what's your take on that? Uh, no, I haven't heard about that. I have heard uh, actually just yesterday there was recently a, a big or actually it may have been this morning I saw it where it was talking about there was a, uh, a big misappropriation of funds. There's a big fraud scheme actually being based out of uh, somewhere in Africa that was actually targeting Washington unemployment claims. Um, so this is an area where again, pointing back to the current state auditor that she should have assessed sort of what the impact was going to be to unemployment uh, with the current processes. And 
Um, unfortunately, because there was no assessment to look at the internal controls and identify what gaps existed um, for the process, you know, to identify, you know, potential fraudulent claims. So people were basically, for unemployment perspective, people were claiming they had their social securities, taking their information, filing unemployment, and the money was going somewhere else, and people uh, were none the wiser. Um, so that just came out, I believe that's today, you can look in the news and find out, and that was targeting specifically Washington. Um, so uh, definitely worth looking into, and uh, something that as state auditor uh, would, would be something I would address. Great, thank you. Um, so I have one question for you. Um, I was just kind of, while you were talking, perusing the auditor's website, yeah. and most government agencies here in Washington State, um, well, actually all executive level ones, are in charge of rulemaking for uh, you know their processes. Um, I noticed that I, I I couldn't immediately find the rulemaking um, area here on the auditor's website. So I'm curious, uh, how would you uh, make that a little bit more transparent for the public? Yeah, I guess, are you talking about rules specifically as they relate to like sort of how we're performing audits and what the process is for that? Right, yes, and, and for public engagement, um, you know, uh, like for instance, the Office of Insurance Commissioner has a rulemaking process so that people who are involved in um, that particular field are able to take a look and, and say, well, I, you know, the legislature set this particular uh requirement upon this office and so um, we are now going to make a set of rules that everybody should comply with here's your notice uh, for um, for public comment right um, and, and so I'm curious to see how you would work with the public yeah I think um, you know I think the big thing is for the risk assessment process the risk assessment is what drives everything that an auditor does um, so you know, that's, I think that's one of the biggest things from a transparency perspective we can do. Um, so what are the inputs that are feeding what audits we're setting as our three-year plan and our one-year plan? Um, that is, that really is the crux of everything that an auditor does. And I think that's definitely where we can be transparent. What are, what are we focusing on? Are we focusing on, you know, just the dollar amount or are there human, you know, is, are we looking at how it's impacting human lives? Are we looking at, you know, underserved communities? Are we looking at, um, you know, how, how is this risk assessment process identifying which audits we need to perform? Um, and I think that's where we can be more transparent and, and display that more publicly for people and, and get their input on what they think should be more considered, you know, make sure we're not admitting anybody who's a minority um, or, or any other area um, that make sure that we're being very inclusive in our audits. Great, thank you. And um, yeah. uh, my, my final question is, um, so what are your influences? Like what, what made you decide that this was the right spot for you to go next? Yeah, I mean, this is something that, you know, I mean, uh, I'm not a career politician. I mean, I'm an auditor, so by trade, and I'm a, you know, a, a leader in my audit trade. Um, so this is just one of those things where, you know, it seemed like, you know, I, I saw this, uh, some of these gaps in, in what was the shortfalls from the previous auditor just are probably more transparent to me as an auditor. Um, it's very easy to, to brush these out under the rug as, to the public, but to an auditor, and I, I know several of my colleagues in the auditing profession, uh, they also feel the same way. They're surprised that more wasn't done by the auditor. And so that's what's really implored me to, to take, the, take the leap. Uh, and to chart to challenge an incumbent uh, Democrat, you know, it's a Democrat in office, and I'm a Democrat, so it's it's definitely a, an odd step, but I felt like it was one that was needed uh, for the Democratic Party, so we have the right leadership in place. Great, thank you. And with that, we are very close to time. So, would you like to go ahead with a one minute uh, wrap up? Yeah, sure. Um, sure. So, uh, you know, as as Washington State Auditor, I would bring both leadership and expertise. Washingtonians don't have to choose between, you know, having just leadership uh, experience or expertise. And it's important to have both. Um, as I mentioned before, on the private sector and public sector, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's something that being a CPA is very crucial to everything that we do. Uh, it has a lot of requirements to make sure from an ethical perspective and independence and objectivity. Uh, and I think I'm a leader that can really uh, make the Democratic Party proud. And, uh, and I believe that, you know, having a leader that they can trust who's not a future, you know, scandal down the road. I mean, I think that there's, you know, the current auditor, she's going to miss something big and it's just a matter of time. Uh, so I think we really need somebody in there who knows what they're doing and also has the leadership experience to bring the audit 
uh, function into the future uh, through modernization. Great, thank you so much.